we do that, let me let me remind you that there's a poster session after the talks. Uh, so I hope to see you there. And uh, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Kristen de Fleming, who's going to tell us about K-moduli of Quartic K3 surfaces. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, happy to be here. If you have any questions during the talk, feel free to ask. I can sort of see the chat, but maybe if there are questions I missed in the chat, please somebody draw my attention to them. I uh, hope to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about an application of, of K moduli, which Yuchen and Zishen both talked about in the lecture series for the first two weeks of the conference. So maybe just as an informal motivation, the ideas we perhaps could have in mind uh, is that if I wanna make moduli spaces of varieties, There's potentially many different stability conditions I can put on those varieties and I can yield different moduli spaces. Um, and maybe more so than just different moduli spaces, different modular compactifications or different compactifications of moduli spaces. And I mean, perhaps the first picture to have in mind is just for curves. So I think the, you know, sort of prototypical example is if we look at MG, the moduli space of smooth curves. There's maybe the, the well-known or standard compactification, mg bar, of Deline Mumford stable curves. Which are, you know, curves with ample canonical class and was worse nodes as, as singularities, so only um, normal crossing singularities, but there's many other compactifications I can make, even you know, just slightly modifying my definition of stability, I can also consider a compactification of MG into what I'll call MG PS for pseudostable. And pseudostable curves in this definition uh, would have potentially at worst cusps. So a slightly different stability condition, uh, a slightly different condition on the singularities. But one thing that important to note, these are certainly birational, so there's certainly a rational map between the two. They both contain mg as a, as a dense open locus inside, but more than, I mean in this case, more than just being birational, there's actually a, a real morphism between these two, and it has a modular interpretation. So not only is there a morphism between these spaces um, as, as varieties, there's or singular spaces, but there's a modular interpretation, meaning I can construct that morphism in families. So if I call this B, and the interpretation is that you contract elliptic tails. So if you have you know, a family of curves and there's some elliptic tail, so just some elliptic curve glued on to the rest of the family at one point, so maybe in my picture this is an elliptic curve, I just contract it and I get a cusp. So this is maybe a classic picture, but I guess it you know, shed light to the more natural question. If we have these different compactifications of moduli spaces arising in different ways, how can we understand maps between them? Can we interpret a but maybe it's just a rational map, but can we interpret that rational map uh, in a modular way with a modular meaning? So what I'd like to focus on today is K3 surfaces with sort of the same, I guess, that motivation in mind. And study the moduli space of K3 surfaces with what ends up being a very fruitful viewpoint to look at um, is K-stability.
So, I mean, just as a small reminder of case stability in case you weren't up about the lecture series for you know, the past couple of weeks, case stability turns out to be the right notion or is at least a good notion to do construct moduli of Fano varieties, uh, moduli spaces of Fano varieties and log Fano pairs. And there's been you know, quite a bit of recent work on the case or the construction of these moduli spaces, but perhaps uh, the first thing that I'll mention, which is really the case we'll be talking about in this in this talk, is just for smoothable varieties. So I think this states to Li Wang Shu and contributions of Odaka that there is a, a good moduli space of K semi-stable smoothable varieties. So, you know, they, if you like to work with stacks, there's an Artin stack or um, a good moduli space and a good moduli space, I should say, parameterizing K semi-stable or if you're looking on the moduli space, polystable smoothable Fano varieties, uh, maybe with you know, fixed volume and dimension. And there's some conditions on the smoothing. So we want you know a nice smoothing, a Hugo Ornstein smoothing, things like that. And a consequence of, I think, what was spoken about in the lecture series is that this actually generalizes beyond the smoothable case. So the K moduli conjecture uh, which was, I guess, a conjecture beyond, um, was essentially a statement of the theorem beyond the smoothable case. And it does indeed generalize due to hard work of many people, um, which were mentioned in the previous talks. But you can also do this for pairs. So this is not just true for varieties, you can do this for pairs. And what's sort of interesting about pairs is once you have a pair, you can put a coefficient on the divisor and varying that coefficient is sort of this analog of varying stability conditions on the varieties, possibly developing many new moduli spaces. So that is, I guess, the focus of what I will mostly talk about here is studying what happens as we vary a coefficient in pairs. So um, with Kenny and Eugen, uh, we, I guess maybe I should say two parts. One part is kind of a consequence of the previous theorem um, and has again been generalized in different settings, but there you know, exists a Artin stack or a good moduli space uh, parameterizing the smoothable pairs. So I'll, hopefully my abbreviations are understandable. If not, please feel free to ask. And there's some conditions on the pair. So not just any pair, but some pair at X, well, let's say alpha D with a fixed Hilbert polynomial. Uh, such that D is a rational multiple of, well, I guess maybe actually the first condition. So the second condition makes sense. <laughs> X is a Fano variety itself. D is a rational multiple of the anti-canonical divisor. And just so that you know, we have singularities of things under control, we can't have alpha be too big. So alpha can go from zero to one, but really just up to R inverse. So there exists this moduli space, and I guess usually, hopefully, many of the details will be cleared from context, and so I'll probably call this M <laughs> bar K alpha. Uh, but the really interesting part that we can leverage to our advantage is that these moduli spaces admit a wall crossing framework. 
as you vary alpha. Right, so I mean, what that means is that there's some finite list of critical values of alpha, I guess going up to the maximum, it could be, such that as long as you're in between these critical values, the moduli space doesn't change. And as you cross one of these critical values, there is a natural wall crossing structure. So there's some, and this there's a precise meaning behind this statement, but maybe to not get too bogged down in technical details, I'll just draw a picture <laughs> of just what I mean. So there's two different, uh, two different sides to this. There's alpha minus epsilon, alpha plus epsilon, and they both map to the one on the critical value. And this, mm. This wall has some nice interpretation in terms of the CM line bundle. What it turns out, I guess the first thing that Kenny Yuchen and I looked at with this is that varying this alpha allows you to connect multiple different moduli spaces. And specifically, we initially focused on plane curves, but we can use this varying of alpha to interpolate between other moduli spaces. And I guess maybe as a remark, to, if you're more familiar with singular, I guess maybe singularities versus the case stability, um, one might vary alpha and C as a consequence of perhaps the following theorem. If you have a log Fano pair that's K semi-stable, then it actually has quite nice singularities. And so if you're less familiar with case stability, you can, this is not an if and only if in any way, but you can think of it sort of this way. When alpha is very small, the moduli spaces we get might have a very singular divisor D. Uh, but when alpha is large, D has to be well, closer to smooth. <laughs> So you could imagine as you vary this alpha, you know, initially maybe alpha is very small and you have this moduli space where X is something, but D is a very singular divisor. And as you increase alpha, you start to see smoother and smoother divisors. You start to replace the ones that are too singular. And that's really, I guess, I don't know, the idea to have in mind. And I guess the goal of today's talk, what I'd like to tell you about in the next 45 minutes is this setup as it's related to K3 surfaces. So K3 surfaces, there's a lot of very you know, rich and important things to say, which I probably won't have time to say. So uh, we'll just recap or mention a few highlights. So a K3 surface, also I should say that everything that I'm talking about in this talk including the previous theorems, this is happening over C. So I know there was a lot of talk of mixed characteristic and things in the lecture series as well, but what I'm saying is happening over C. So a K3 surface, uh, let's just call it S, is a projective surface with, I guess we can allow a mildly singular, we'll actually talk about degenerations of K3 surfaces, but we'll say with Duval singularities such that the canonical divisor is trivial and H1 of O is zero. And we'll be talking about polarized K3 surfaces. It is a pair, so I guess we'll call it S L, L uh, with S a K3 surface and L an ample line bundle.
And the reason I'm throwing this in there is that this allows us to define the degree. And I guess in terms of the degree also, what's known as the genus, uh, the degree I guess we'll just call D. Sometimes this is written as 2D because it happens to be an even number um, is whatever L squared is, whatever the self-intersection of L is. So the K3 surfaces, I guess, have some sort of very nice, polarized K3 has a very nice understanding in terms of what happens uh, if you look at the, you know, in the ra potentially rational map given by this L. So this theorem, which maybe be the starting point, originally just Meyer is that if I consider the map or the um, potentially rational map, but from S to, it turns out to PG, where G is this G, this genus, there are three possibilities for what can happen. And I guess the first case is the generic for as long as the D is at least four. And this generic case is when this map is birational onto a normal surface. Of degree D. There's also the hyperelliptic case. When this is a two to one cover. So sort of similar to what we might think of as hyperelliptic curves. So if I look at the morphism from X to its image, it's two to one onto a normal surface. of degree d over two. And in this case, the general member of the linear system L actually is hyperelliptic. So the terminology also fits into that picture. And then there's one more case, the unigonal case. And in this case, the map drops dimension and the image is a rational curve of degree G. And the general member, um, excuse me, the, the, the general fiber or the fiber of this map are elliptic curves. And the reason I'm pointing this out is perhaps in today's talk, I will mostly focus on the hyperelliptic case, but we can talk about the other cases as well. So this is what a K3 is. <laughs> the talk is about moduli of quartic K3s. So what hopefully we can do with this information is connect this to moduli spaces. And there's a sort of standard or starting place of a moduli of K3 surfaces. So there's There's a natural moduli space, which I'll just call F, um, coming from Hodge theory. And the global Torelli theorem of these K3 surfaces and a compactification F star, which I guess can be realized as the projective or the ample model of the Hodge line bundle on this space. But so this moduli space comes from Hodge theory, it comes from looking at the period domain, that's it's F, of our K3 surfaces. So looking at um, this natural lattice structure that they have, but it generally doesn't have a well behaved universal family. So it 
in the, on the boundary of F star, the points that we're getting are, in terms of moduli space, maybe correspond to many different potential types of K3 surfaces. Um, so it's a natural to ask, how do we compare this F star? Oops, I forgot the word compare. Can we compare this F star with other compactifications? And I mean, the answer is going to be yes. And it turns out that the answer is yes with many different perspectives. But again, today, the perspective that we'll talk about is from case stability. So the first example, which won't be the focus, but it's maybe the starting point, if we're talking about degree two K3s, so that says this L squared is, is two. And in this case, the map phi L goes from S to P2. So if you, you know, in the previous theorem of Meyer that I wrote, I said the generic case for D at least four is when this is birational or maybe when this is an embedding. But in this case, the degree two case, we're only going to P2, so it's not going to be an embedding, but the generic one is hyperelliptic. And the image is, you know, I guess it's, so it's the generic one is two to one to P2, and it's branched over a sextic curve. in P2. So one way to study the these hyperelliptic K3s is by studying moduli of sextic plane curves. And in fact, I mean, there's a couple of different interpretations to do this. But one natural moduli space you might be interested in for plane curves is the GIT moduli space. So by this notation, uh, maybe it's self-explanatory, maybe not. I'll be looking at curves of degree six in P2 that are GIT semi-stable. Or maybe polystable. I'm being a little bit sloppy about talking about stacks versus moduli spaces or anything like this. Um, but the generic, I mean, the generic curve of this, if you have a curve with, you know, a smooth or even with nice singularities, uh, corresponds to one of these K3s with AD singularities. So there certainly is a a, a map between these two things. So the, I mean, the Torelli theorem, the global Torelli tells us that these two are, in fact, birational. And I'm going to draw the map going from the Bailey Burrell space to the GIT moduli space for reasons that hopefully will be clear soon. Um, but they certainly are birational and we might be interested in resolving this map. In fact, this has already been done. So by work of Shaw and Loenga, oops, there is a moduli space, which for now I'll just call M, that has a nice interpretation that sits above both of these uh, where this map, we will call it psi, is a Q factorialization of a particular divisor. So right, this is really due this interpretation. I could spell. There we go. Uh, as a Q factorialization of a particular Hegner divisor parameterizing the unigonal K3s. So there's this divisor, maybe we'll call H, in this moduli space. And this psi is the um, Q factorialization of that divisor. And this map B on the other side is a partial Kirwan desingularization. Oops. of this GIT space obtained by blowing up 
a particular point. So in here, there's a particular point that parameterizes the triple conic. And um, this map phi is a particular type of weighted blow up of that point. And really, I guess this is due to Shaw here. So everything that I've written down has nothing to do with case stability, but with uh, the framework of case stability, you can interpret all of these moduli spaces uh, as k-moduli spaces or models of k-moduli spaces. So with uh, Kenny and Yu Chen, what we show is that this GIT moduli space is actually the k-moduli space. So maybe I should include some notation down here. Let's say m bar k alpha is mod will be a k-moduli space of pairs. I'll say x um, alpha c, where x is a degeneration of p2, and c is potentially a degeneration of a sextic plane curve. So I guess I could just write it like this, right? C is two times the canonical divisor, um, where these are, you know, k semi-stable and polystable. You could define the k moduli space of these log fauna pairs as long as alpha is between zero and one half. And you can actually match that up with all of these. So I guess our work shows that this GIT moduli space is in fact the K moduli space of the log fauna pairs, uh, P2 with a curve, as long as alpha is between zero and one fourth. Then you blow up this triple conic and you get this sort of mystery space M, but it is in fact the K moduli space again of these pairs, but now when alpha is between zero, or excuse me, one fourth and one half. And this last map phi going from you know, this k moduli space to, or sorry, this last map psi going from this k moduli space to f star is in fact the ample model of the Hodge bundle on this moduli space. So this also has a k, um, k moduli interpretation in terms of, I mean, I have only defined k, k moduli spaces for log fauna pairs. So when alpha is one half, we're no longer log fauna, but we could take the ample model of the Hodge bundle on this space and get F star. So this existing framework, so I guess everything in pink <laughs> is uh, something we study in our first paper on plane curves. We can study this existing framework matching the bailey borel moduli space of degree two K3s with the GIT moduli space of degree two K3s and recast all of the notions in terms of k-stability and get exactly, recover exactly the same picture. So one might hope from this framework <laughs> that you can do this for K3s of higher degree. And that is indeed the case. And so that is what we you know, hope to talk about or what I hope to talk about uh, for the rest of the talk. We want to now apply this to quartic K3s. And in this case, things get a bit more complicated. Our quartic K3s, we have our three cases, you know, studying our polarized K3. Now the genus is three, so we're going from S to P3, and we have three choices. I mean, the generic thing, we can get an embedding as a quartic surface. So this numbering will match up with what I put above. Uh, two, we can have a, this be a two to one map uh, where the image is a rational surface of degree two. And conveniently, <laughs> we happen to know what these are. So, right, so we can have the quadric surface um, P1 plus P1, or we could have a singular quadric surface, um, the quadric cone, which I'll use the way to projected space notation, 
uh, P112. So the hyperelliptic case, they're branched over something we understand. Uh, part three though, the unigonal case. So part two is the hyperelliptic case. And part three is the unigonal case where the image is the twisted cubic. And the fibers of the map from S to the twisted cubic are elliptic curves. So this last one, uh, we get elliptically fibered K3s. Okay. So we studied this whole picture, but for the purpose of this talk and comparing to what I just said in the degree um, two case, we'll focus temporarily on the hyperelliptic case. And if there's time, maybe I'll say something about <laughs> the unigonal case and the general case. So just now focusing on the hyperelliptic K3s, we might hope to do something exactly as in the degree two case, where we just look at moduli of curves on these given surfaces. And in fact, we can do this. So right, the hyperelliptic core to K3s, we have our map S goes two to one onto some quadric surface. And we also know the branch locus. It's either a four, four curve on P1 cross P1, or in terms of the uh, coordinates on P112, um, I guess you can say that it has degree eight <laughs> on, in terms of the weights on P112. Both of these can be thought of in either case. If I look at the quadric surface and the branch curve, this is some quadric surface in P3, and at least we can think of C as a 2-4 complete intersection in P3. So, just like in the degree two case, we can consider moduli of these uh, curves on these surfaces <laughs> or moduli really of two four complete intersections in P3. And similarly, even though this is only a you know, sort of slice of the whole um, locus of K3 surfaces, we still have two different compactifications that we can start with. I'll call it F star H, the Bailey Burrell moduli space of hyperelliptic K3. The H stands for hyperelliptic. <laughs> and as the generic one of these hyperelliptic curves will be branched over a 4 4 curve, we could also consider the GIT moduli space of four four curves on P1 cross P1. Oops, P1 cross P1. And it turns out there's still a rational map between these two spaces, um, but we're seeing already, I mean, we have some of these curves are going to be branched over P112. Those aren't appearing here. Those are going to form a divisor here. So that's already something we're going to have to take into account. But this map has, you know, quite complicated exceptional loci in general. But we want to interpolate between these two spaces. And there's two natural perspectives that one could take. Because I have defined this um, as a GIT moduli space, we could, you know, one interpolate using VGIT, and this has already been done. 
by work of Laza and O'Grady. So variation of GIT making some ultimately defining some line bundle on the space of two, four complete intersections in P3 and varying that, you know, varying that line bundle to connect these in a VGIT picture. But as you know, mentioned in the talk, <laughs> uh, we can also consider the framework of these two comparing them with case stability. And it turns out in this case, what we'll see is that these are going to coincide. This is, will be special to 4-4 curves, but just like the previous case for degree 2 K3s, the case stability framework coincided with an existing framework. We'll also see that for 4-4 curves. So I guess I don't have so much time, and I would like to say a few things about, <laughs> a few more things about this. So let's, uh, I'll just jump into some of the results. So if I want to interpolate between the Bailey Braille moduli space and the GIT moduli space, these should both connect with K3, moduli of K3, uh, excuse me, <laughs> moduli of K stable log Fano pairs somehow. And in fact, they do. So if I consider the K moduli space, in this case of pairs, log Fano pairs X alpha D, you know, where in this case, X can be a degeneration of P1 cross P1, so this will be just like what happened for um, degree two K3s with the sextic plane curves. And D is two times the anti-canonical of X. And these are gonna be K semi-stable or polystable. Again, I'm being a little bit sloppy about the stack versus the coarse moduli space, but, um, and I'm also being a little bit sloppy by saying degeneration. I do mean the nice Q-Gorenstein degeneration and different things here. Uh, but this moduli space, which we already you know, know to exist, just like in the picture for degree two, coincides with the GIT moduli space as long as alpha is sufficiently small. So when alpha is between zero and one eighth, this GIT moduli space uh, of the four four curves on P1 cross P1 is exactly the K moduli space we get uh, between zero and alpha. At one eighth, something changes. So this is the first wall crossing. At one eighth, we actually can see that we'll degenerate curves on P1 cross P1 to a curve on P112 and have this be K polystable. So the, you know, we're going to introduce a new curve and have it change. So at alpha equals one eighth, what happens? I mean, I can think about, you know, my quadric surface here. If I take four times a one one curve, so just you know, the general hyperplane section here, and I let D be four times that single curve. At one eighth, we're looking at the pair P1 cross P1, one eighth times four Q, so one half Q. And it turns out that this admits a special degeneration to P112 and a section, I guess I'll call it Q naught, of P112. So this admits a special degeneration. to one eighth of four times <laughs> that Q naught. So it looks a little silly to write one eighth times four because that is just one half, but um, the curve we're considering in our moduli space of four, four curves is four times Q. And it happens that at um, alpha equals one eighth, this pair is K policy. So at one eighth, we're getting the first wall. And what we're doing is blowing up on terms of the moduli spaces, we're blowing up the double conic, or excuse me, the four times this conic, four times this one one curve. And 
when I blow up that point, I'm replacing it in the moduli space with a divisor that parameterizes exactly curves on P112. So maybe I should write the blow up on the actual map on the level of the moduli spaces. So in the picture of what we're trying to resolve, right, we cross this first wall at 1 8 We're trying to resolve the moduli space going all the way to this bailey Burrell moduli space. We know we have the divisor here that parameterizes these curves on P112. And so the first wall is extracting that divisor birationally, um, at least. and it will get carried through the remaining wall crossings. So, I mean, this still is not a morphism. We have many wall crossings to go, uh, but we can explicitly describe them. And I believe there are eight. So there are eight explicit K-moduli walls uh, from zero to this alpha one, which is one eighth, the first wall crossing that we see and going up to alpha n, stopping at one half, where this first wall is this blow up. So it's divisorial contraction on the level of the moduli spaces, if you're imagining decreasing alpha. The remaining walls are flips. And moreover, the moduli space, if I look at the very end of the picture. So now, I guess, maybe we imagine starting with the GIT moduli space, crossing the first wall, and then having these remaining flips until we get to one half minus epsilon. This last moduli space at one half minus epsilon admits a morphism to F star. And this size, a small, morphism, it is a Q factorialization of the divisor. I guess I should, I called it E before. So I'll call it E star <laughs> um, parameterizing curves on P112. So although we have many more walls in this picture, so I mean, this is, you can sort of imagine the left-hand side of the picture and then many more walls until we get to this up at the top, which is the right-hand side of the picture, it sort of parallels what we see in the moduli space of degree 2 K3s. Okay. And the key reason that we can do this is, in fact, the K moduli spaces here connect nicely to the moduli spaces of complete intersections, 2, 4 complete intersections in P3. Okay. So sort of a key observation or a key tool in using this <laughs> is the following result, that for any alpha, for any coefficient between zero and one half, if the pair X alpha D is in one of these moduli spaces, these K moduli spaces, so if it is K semi-stable, then X is actually P1 cross P1 or P112. This is only for 4 4 curves. So maybe I should say uh, in the moduli cases we're talking about, I, don't know, I guess I'll just put this as a remark. <laughs> So special for these K moduli spaces of 4, 4 curves. Uh, it's not true, for instance, on 3, 3 curves or 5, 5 curves. <laughs> so even for 3, 3 curves, this is false. Uh, the surface, you know, X, which is P129, or a partial smoothing of P129, um, appears uh, in you know, mk alpha for some alpha. I guess alpha close to two thirds.
So in any case, this, this remark that x is either p1 cross p1 or p102 is special for 4, 4 curves. And this is really useful. I mean, the, I guess, proof of the previous result uses the index estimate and in local, in terms of the local volume. for k semi-stable pairs. So if a pair in this case is k semi-stable, we have some control over the index of the canonical divisor and we can rule out this one because the canonical divisor has index three. So essentially we can rule out the other curves. Um, but the consequence of this result, right? The, the consequence <laughs> that I'd like to highlight for four four curves Um, all of the pairs appearing in these k-moduli spaces are in fact surfaces in of degree two and P3 and curves of degree four on those surfaces, right? So X is some element in uh, some surface of degree two and D is, I don't know why I put brackets around D, uh, is in the linear system O4 on X. In particular, Right, D is a 2-4 complete intersection uh, in all of these k-moduli spaces. So we can relate these and just generally moduli of 2-4 complete intersections in P3. And what I mean by that is that Laza and O'Grady study these two four complete intersections and you know, set up this sort of similar framework. Right? We have, I guess, a parameter space of the quadric surface. So maybe I'll call it you know, projectivization P of P3 O2. Hopefully we've got enough parentheses. <laughs> and we have our surface X is a point in there. We're gonna consider a projective bundle over that projective space that gives also the curve. So the fibers of this bundle are the you know, degree four curves on our projective space. And we can consider the locus inside here of the two, four complete intersection curves. And so what Laws and O'Grady, I mean, do is, is define a notion of VGIT for these two, four complete intersection curves. Um, unfortunately, this U itself is not proper. <laughs> and the natural line bundle you might want to use to do VGIT is not ample on this natural sort of compactification of U. So in fact, it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, one looks at the rational map to the Chow variety of two, four complete intersections and takes the graph of this map turns out U also is an embedding in here, and we define a line bundle, uh, Laws and O'Grady define a line bundle NT on this graph P, uh, this is ample, I suppose, <laughs> and consider uh, the VGIT moduli spaces um, of this ample line bundle. So I guess with respect to SL4, with respect to the automorphisms of P3. So I won't try to precisely state all the theorems uh, in this context, but it is quite, uh, quite remarkable because this natural line bundle, this NT is uh, more complicated than you'd like it to be. And it restricts to something nice on U, but on the entire space P, it's something ample and it's some combination of line bundles on this PE and line bundle on the Chow variety. 
Um, but it turns out that all of their VGIT wall crossings are exactly the K moduli wall crossings. So, I mean, in terms of a maybe simple slogan, <laughs> the K moduli walls exactly coincide with the VGIT walls. And you know, a precise statement of that would be that our K moduli spaces, MK alpha in this case, coincide with these VGIT moduli spaces uh, up to some transformation relating T and alpha. T and alpha are not the same, um, but they're related. So I hopefully copied it down right. Uh, three alpha over three alpha plus two. Okay. And this comes exactly from comparing the line bundle NT to the CM line bundle on the K moduli space. And because all of the pairs that we're considering in the K moduli space live inside this locus U of the complete intersections, so this locus from the top of the page, we can just directly compute what the CM line bundle is here and show that it is this agrees with the restriction of NT on P to U. Again, this is not true in general. This is very special to 4-4 four, four curves. So again, if you jump back to the picture of 3-3 three, three curves, you have the VGIT walls if you try to set up the same picture and the VGIT walls do give some subset of the K moduli walls, but there are more K moduli walls, meaning there are curves that are always VGIT stable or semi-stable uh, as you do this wall crossing for three, three curves, uh, but they become K unstable at some coefficient. So you don't see them in the VGIT moduli spaces, but you see them in the K moduli spaces. So, Ultimately, uh, we can construct all of the K moduli wall crossings just by comparing to the VGIT wall crossings and the work of Laza and O'Grady. And this is really foundational to the picture of percortic K3s in general. So, you know, only a couple of more minutes, and maybe I should just, um, I'm not going to try to go into detail, but I'll give a a sort of brief you know, picture of the general case. So everything that I've said so far, right, does sort of discusses the, what happens for the hyperelliptic K3s. And all the hyperelliptic K3s, we can understand uh, their moduli via, you know, this above picture. where we study the 4-4 four, four curves on P1 cross P1. But that's only one part of the moduli space of the quartic K3s in general, right? So our general picture of, for our quartic K3s, the generic one is a, you know, quartic surface <laughs> in P3. And then in terms of the moduli space, we have a divisor, a co-dimension one locus parameterizing these hyperelliptic curves and a co-dimension one locus parameterizing the unigonal K3s. So ultimately, if we come up with the bailey borel moduli space, we have our compactification F star and there's two divisors in here. So the generic point is a quartic surface in P3. And then there's two divisors. So maybe there's an HH and an HU. My H's and U's maybe look a little too similar, the capital H. And the HH, this is a divisor parameterizing the hyperelliptic K3s, which 
I guess the point is we understand. And then the HU is a little bit more mysterious. It's the one parameterizing these univinyl K3s, which are the elliptic fiber, uh, the elliptically fibered K3s. But we can attempt to do the same thing. We can say, oh, well, we have, you know, the generic cortic K3 is a surface, a cortic surface in P3. So one compactification of a moduli space there would be the GIT moduli space of degree four. In particular, the GIT of cortic surfaces in P3. And we could again try to match up the Bailey Burrell moduli space F star with this GIT moduli space. And Laza and O'Grady, in their study of the, the hyperelliptic locus and things, make many predictions and come up with a, some description or results of what should happen in this moduli space. And it turns out using case stability, we can verify their, uh, verify their predictions. And ultimately, I mean, to, I guess, sort of <laughs> very, very briefly summarize it, um, how do we interpolate? Uh, we use case stability and we get the same picture that this MGIT is the K moduli space for alpha sufficiently small of pairs P3 with a quartic surface. And we can, ex first of all, extract a divisor. This is the first wall. Parameterizing the hyperelliptic K3s. So it turns out all of the hyperelliptic K3s, these, they embed into a cone over P1 cross P1. So that's how we get the hyperelliptic picture. Uh, we can use the wall crossings for the hyperelliptic K3s. to describe any walls uh, where I guess I should say, I'll put this in quotes, but intersecting this hyperelliptic divisor. So what I mean by that is at some point there'll be a wall crossing of curves and if that locus of these surfaces that has to be replaced as you cross the wall intersects the hyperelliptic divisor, we can use those wall crossings to understand what's going on there. And then last but not least, you do have to study the unigonal walls separately, but it turns out there's just one of them. And it turns out you just have to extract a divisor by blowing up a point that parameterizes the unigonal K3s. So the moral of the story is using case stability, we can explicitly interpolate. So what I've written isn't very explicit, but I promise there is an explicit interpolation of where all the walls are and what's being replaced at each wall between the GIT moduli space of cortic K3 surfaces and the Bailey Burrell moduli space of cortic K3 surfaces. And you doing so verify sort of many predictions that have been made about this hasek kiel Luanga program for um, interpolating between these two moduli spaces. So I'm out of time, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for Kristen? Well, if there are no questions, then a uh, quick announcement. Again, I encourage you to uh, join us in Gavatown. There's a link in the chat uh, for the poster session. And let's thank Kristen once again. Thank you.